presence that's in our lives, flowing out of our lives. And when we come together, there's just an amazing atmosphere because of the personal presence in our life combined in each other just brings such a heavenly atmosphere. And we just thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation, knowledge that we're learning, and the understanding of these seven mountain. And God, how it's helping us really get it regarding our purpose, our divine assignment, our uh, calling to answer your call towards the Great Commission, to really bring forth heaven on earth. And so, Lord, we thank you, God. We just ask that you, uh, this last night of this teaching, that help get what needs to be getting out so that we can hear it, receive it in our heart, not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of it, to put it into practice and to really start climbing higher the mountain that you've placed us on. We just ask for your blessing over this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. we got a long ways to go, so there won't be a lot of time to discuss today. But after class, we can discuss, but we just got a long ways to go, and I want to make sure we get it all out because it's a very, very important subject that we're covering. This subject has been just such an excitement for me just to teach it. It's probably the, one of the most important subjects I felt like I've taught, and um, I'm going to teach it in many different capacities now. I'll be teaching it to our young adults. I'm going to be teaching it, Jonathan's going to be teaching it to our youth. We're going to be teaching it on fifth Sundays as our mission Sunday, as a mission of the church for uh, however many weeks it takes to teach it. So it'll be taught to the whole church. So you're just getting it ahead of time. <laughs> and uh, probably be teaching it at a youth camp this summer. So going to get a lot of it and give me a lot of opportunity to get more and more revelation so we can teach it even the next level of this in 2019. So, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, let's get right into it. So, just a quick summary for those who weren't here. Um, again, you can get all that, you've, all that we've done. It's, as you see, being videotaped. It's on um, praisebibleinstitute.org. And it's on our Facebook PBI page. And it's on our YouTube channel. Praise Tabernacles YouTube channel, though, right? Yeah. So Praise Tabernacles YouTube channel, you can find it there. So those all the places you can find it. And if you can't find it still, let me know, and I will send you an email or send it through social media to you. You can go to our website, praisetabernacle.com. It's right at the bottom. Scroll all the way down the bottom. It's shifting to our YouTube channel. Yeah, so, yep, I'll take you right to the YouTube channel on our praisetabernacle.com. So, so many different ways to find it. Can't miss it. And if you can't, then you can, I can help you. But here we go, the seven mountain strategy. What we've been learning here, number one, this is really giving us the understanding of what the Great Commission really looks like. What it really means to disciple nations, which was the last commandment of Jesus and his greatest commandment. I think our concept in the years past has been making disciples of individuals, and that's part of it, and, make, and sending missionaries out all over the world, and that's part of it. But that's just the beginning part of it. I think we've missed the rest, and the rest is discipling nations. And because we haven't really got this concept, we basically said, Satan, okay, I know you're defeated, but you know what? We're going to give you the keys back again, even though God through his son, took it away from you. And you can get back and take rulership over all these different areas of society, and we'll just hang out in our church buildings and worship God and sing Kumbaya until we go up to glory. So uh, we might have fallen behind quite a bit, but as anybody knows, if you're a football fan and you like the Patriots, which I don't, you got Brady at quarterback, you got Jesus as Savior, Brady's definitely not Jesus, but he always usually comes back and wins, and Jesus and his church will win and has already won because of what he's done. But let's get on it and get... Well, that's a bad analogy. Brady's not going to win this time. Not next, no, not next game, but... In the years past, in the other Super Bowls, he usually wins. 
but not this year. But dominion mandate, the beginning, God called us to have dominion on earth. What does that mean? What does that look like? Does it mean just having good church services? Or does rulership be, go beyond a building gathering for two hours every week? Dominion means much more. Heaven on earth, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Everyone's so caught up in going to heaven, but why are we not caught up in bringing heaven to earth? And what would that look like if we did? You know, from what I've taught and been learned all these years, heaven on earth just means basically seeing people healed and delivered and saved. That's about it. And that's, very few people even believe that, that are supposed to be believers. They believe in God for salvation, but often a lot of denominations don't even believe God for healing and deliverance, let alone this stuff. So, restoration of all things. Jesus said, I'm seated in heaven until the restoration of all things. What are the all things? Is it just souls? Or is it all things? <laughs> means all things. Means everything. God wants to invade every area of society. And that's what we're learning. And we're, what we need to see is what is our assignment. Because I find that most people that get spiritual either feel like they're called to, they're called to be on a pulpit some way, somehow. And what about everything else in life, <laughs> in society? Why can't people be called in every way, in everywhere. And um, so I'm hoping that as we go over each mountain, and these mountains are the basic areas of culture. You might not find every job under these mountains, but most of them you can find. You know, and Jesus said to do what until he comes back? Occupy. Occupy is short for occupation can be short for that occupation. So we're to have an occupation. We're supposed to have a job. We're supposed to be doing something. We have an assignment. We have a reason we're here. And part of our assignment, a big part of our assignment, is our job. And not just to work to get a paycheck, but to work to solve problems on God's behalf through his power. So we're going to start today. We're in the mountain of media right here. So we're going to tackle these mountains for them hopefully today and a last chapter on just final like conclusion to understanding all this the mountain of media hope everybody has a pen i'm going to go kind of quick okay the enemy in media would be represented by the Hittites. Again, the children of Israel went over to the promised land, but now they had enemies that they had to conquer. We've been given the promised land by what Jesus has done. The promised land is now the world. And just like the children of Israel had ites to conquer, we have ites to conquer. These mountains. The enemies, the Hittites, they represent terror or fear. It's bad news. The principality is Apollyon, means destroyer. So we must never forget that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. It's not people. People don't know any better, often. Or when they do know better, they've just been totally deceived, misled. So we're really wrestling our job and taking, you know, people say, we're going to take the land, we're going to take the world. That's not an understanding how we do it is as you would have back in the medieval times with the sword. That is, we're taking the world through spiritual warfare. And by also putting us in position where we can make a difference, where we can change laws, where we can do things so that things are being done God's way rather than the devil's way. Then Apollyon destroys through deception, lying, and twisting the truth. Speaking out of both sides of the mouth. Example of Scorpion from Revelations 9, 10 through 11. The enemy on the Mount of Media gives an unredemptive expression of what has taken place. It is destructive through distorting the news. 
You know, and I'll just tell you my source of news because it's very important that we as God's people are aware of what's going on in the world. We cannot just shut off news saying that's all negative and it's all bad. We have to have our Holy Spirit ears on as we're listening to it for discernment, number one. But it's best to try to find a news channel. In today's world, almost all news channels have a twist and have a turn. So I try to find just a, a, a news that just tells me the news without analyzing everything. They just basically tell you what's happening, and that's it, without giving their opinions. I don't look for opinion-based news. I look for fact-based news as close to it as possible. Well, I use uh, Reuters, which is, you know, you can do five to 30-minute news, and it basically just goes from fact to fact to fact. There's no opinions involved in it. Reuters. R-E-U-T-E-R-S. And I don't find it leans really liberal or conservative. I find it just tells me what's going on. Where do you find it? Uh, there's apps. There's website. So R-E-U-T-E-R-S. -E I just like to get a dose of what's going on in the world. I don't want to sit for hours. Some people love it, but for hours and hours listening to um, everybody analyzing it and giving their opinions. And you know what, also you can get transcripts online of speeches that are spoken so you can read exactly what say the president or the senator or that senator actually said. Yeah. And it cuts out all the other stuff. Yep. So the assignment on the mountain of media. This is our God, the assignment. If you're called to that mountain of media, media, this is your assignment. To be a bearer of good news, which is the opposite of what the majority of media is today. Of course, Satan wants to do the opposite of what God wants to do. God want, has called us to bring forth good news. Satan wants bad news. Because bad news creates negative thinking. Fear. You know, good news brings positive thinking. Faith. So Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things. The good news is not only the news of sal salvation, but also of good things. So there's a lot of good things to talk about. When you walk with God, there's a lot of good things. Those who walk with God have a lot of good stuff to talk about. You really should. Even the bad things always turn around for good when you walk with God. Yeah. Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. Conversely, negative words can cause sickness. It's the power of negative words. It can cause sickness. A lot of sickness people have is because of, as we're going to find out in the later chapter, is because of family you know what most disease is because of family? Family is the thing that hurts us the most when our families are not in order. And so depression and um, feeling bad because of how bad things are in our home usually is the leading cause to what brings forward disease. The leading causes of what bring forward disease. So when things are not right at home, we have worry, we have stress, we have fear, we have all kinds of things, and that's what creates a lot of our diseases. Media, you know, negativity, all these kind of things. Redemptive news is truthful, but brings hope. This is how God communicates with us, as in how he spoke to the churches in Revelations 2 through 3. So there's times, you know, you can't always, there's times where we have to bear not really good news, but we just have to be truthful to somebody. It might, to them, not sound very good because you have to be honest with people sometimes. You have to correct people. You have to correct your children. You have to correct your spouse sometimes. You have to correct people at work. So how do you do that when you want called to be a bearer of good news? Well, the sandwich approach. Say something positive, then put in the middle the beef or the concern, and then end with something else positive. It's a graceful way to communicate with family at church and workplace, as well as a great way for news to be reported in media. So you can still bear good news even when you have to correct. When you start with good and you end with good, as long as you end with good especially, it's going to help. So always remember that when you have to correct somebody. 
The enemy's purpose on the mountain of media is to bring fear, terror, and anxiety because it prepares hearts for seeds of further gloom. The devil wants us to have to lose our hope. What does it say? When you lose hope, the heart becomes sick. The church must provide a new source of credibility that can be trusted in every nation. I just saw that uh, you know, one of the main teachers of, of Seven Mountain Strategies, Lance Wall now, and I don't know if he continues to have or I just noticed it today, but he has like his own Lance Wall now news. So it was a 35 minute, nice professional background and all that. So it looked like, I think he maybe started a new thing, but it might be, and he was basically talking about the shutdown and all that, what that means and all the different things that are going on and how, you know, God and prophetic and how is it all connected, you know, so that's a good news source. Anytime you broadcast something that is actually happening a small percent of the time, as if it is a larger percentage of time, you're distorting the truth. And that is exactly what goes on with CNN and maybe Fox as well. But it's so blown up. One little issue is like that's most time it's like one issue that's talked about all over all the day, all time over and over from a different person, different person, different person. If you hear it over and over and over again, it just becomes huge, distorted. So this really began when CNN started the 24-7 news. Things weren't so negative in the world, perspective-wise, before there was 24-7 news. But once 24-7 news started in like 1991 or so, just negativity was just the airwaves. It's nice that we can watch news at any time, any place, but the kind of news is the key. Guideline motto for those in media. Guideline and motto for those in media. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Or publish these things. Wouldn't it be good to hear good news all the time? CBN News. You know the nice thing about CBN News? It has a good portion of what's happening in the world, but then it has mostly the rest of the news time is testimonies of miracles happening. So if you watch CBN's Our News 700 Club, which they've had around for the last 50, 60 years... Um, you get a dose of what's happening in the world, but you get 90% of the show is, is miracles and healings. What's happening with God's power in the world? And that brings a lot of good news. We're going to, see, the world is tired of bad and hopeless news. We're never going to see transformation of society just by having enough good things take place on the mountain of religion where the church is. We have to be out there in practical engagement of the culture and geographically take the land. You know, most people in the world, how they see the church is, they see the church as haters. They don't see us as positive bearers of good news. They see the church only speak up when they have something to say of how bad society is or how wrong something is. We speak up to talk about how we're against homosexuality, how we're against, you know, abortion, and those things are, of course, important concerns. But are we saying anything else? Is that all that the world's hearing? Do we have any other way to bring good news? So it's not good that we're known, you know, have you ever known somebody? That's just how you know them. When they come in the room, you know that they're going to bring nothing but bad news. There's going to be negative Anybody like people like that, that just are negative all the time? It's like hanging out with negative people. Call them the um, Debbie Doubters or the, they just down, you know, you say something and then they twist it into something bad. You know, it's like, I don't like negative people around me. I try to run from them. Sometimes there's some of them in church. I try to sneak away. <laughs> Coming down the hallway, if you see me running, you know, somebody's. <laughs> uh, 
Always a problem. All they have to do is all they can do is bring me a problem. Nothing positive. Anyway. Why do we feel anxiety when we hear bad news? How is disease being released into society through the mountain of media? Listen to this. This is Dr. Masuro Emoto, a Japanese scientist, showed the effects of certain sounds and words and how thoughts and emotions behind them altered the molecular structure of water. The test consisted in exposing water to these agents, freezing them and then pho photographing the water crystals that form while freezing. He found that words have a frequency or energy, whether spoken or written. Now, this is talking about water, but look at this. Everything is at the same at the subatomic level and has a frequency or sound. Earth and humans are roughly two-thirds water. The younger we are, the higher percentage of water we are. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So you see how even younger people, if younger people grow up in a negative environment, what do they become? That's why it's so important to speak life and not death. Most people that are messed up in this life is because of what was spoken over them when they were young. Your tongue is the most powerful weapon you have. We have an assignment to cut off the constant broadcasting of bad news coming from the principality and media, Apollyon, that's preparing the ground to receive more of the kingdom of darkness. Okay, I'm going to skip some parts. Like the mouth and tongue, we understand the scriptures regarding the mouth, how powerful the mouth is. The t mouth, our tongue, is one of the most powerful weapons there is in this world. So therefore, if what you're hearing going through your ears is nothing but negative, then it's going to fill your system within full of negativity, which again brings forth disease, sickness. So you got to shut. It's okay to shut some people out of your life. Shut the negative people out. If they're not willing to get help, that's how I am. If somebody's out, let negative people in. If they're willing to get help and hear the truth and be guided towards a better path, but if they're not, God shut them out. Because they're, it's just like secondhand smoke. Secondhand smoke can kill you, right? Secondhand words can kill you, can affect you. Toxic, I don't want to hear it. I have a shield of protection around me in Jesus' name, but I, you know, I don't need it in my life. So be careful what you're hearing. Our assignment for those who are called to this mountain to have the news reporting agencies of trust and confidence in every nation we expect to see reformation. In order to see a nation become a sheep nation, there must be at least one dominant media outlet that's run by kingdom believers. A lot of wars have happened because of media. The war in Rwanda happened mainly because of media. It was the lies on the radio that infected the people that caused that war power of media. In communist countries, they cut off the media of everything they don't want you to hear, so you only hear what they want to tell you. Shutting off communication channel. So uh, that's the power of media. It's a very important mountain to have believers on. To understand redemptive news reporting, when we eulogize someone, we remember at their death the redemptive perspective of their life, we must arise and give a different perspective. The main gift on this mountain that God wants to release is the mantle of evangelists. Evangelists may have an assignment on the mountain of media to condition the atmosphere for the kingdom of God. The greatest good news is that Jesus saves, but we have reduced evangelism to just that. Jesus doesn't just save. He said he came to give us life and life more abundantly. The God kind of life, heaven on earth, to bless us in every area of our life, to redeem us, to restore us, to remove guilt and shame. There's so much we can talk about, about the goodness of Jesus beyond just salvation. That's part of it, but it's just the beginning. 
So God's people must get involved in newspapers, magazines, TV channels, internet, Facebook, Twitter, blogs, YouTube. These things are not of the devil unless we give them to them. These things are opportunities. I told you before how many, um, just by using Facebook. I don't use Facebook to mind people's business like a lot of people do. I mainly use Facebook so I can impact people by sowing seed of the word of God. And through sowing seed, I've been able to impact the people I'm no longer around, like the kids I grew up with in Quinault. Some of them have poured out their heart to me during desperate times of need. I've been able to lead people to the Lord in different countries of the world simply through Facebook. So while everybody's shutting off Facebook because they're so weak that they can't handle going on it without getting caught up and wasting a bunch of time, we can use these sources if we allow the Spirit of God to take control of our lives. We can use these sources to minister to people, to plant seeds, to impact lives, to change destinies, instead of running from it, afraid that, you know, we're just going to get caught up in a lot of stuff. We're going to see inappropriate stuff and all that kind of stuff. No, we just got to put a filter on our eyes and, and be cautious, but use the platforms that God has given us. You know, some people are really afraid of how technology is advancing and what it can do and how the devil is going to use it and all that. I'm saying how we can use it. God's allowing it to be discovered. So let's use it. The devil is going to do what he does, but let's take it and redeem it and restore it and use it for his glory every single area that's out there. You call on them, this mountain is to release hope. So this is our great opportunity to bring hope in the world. Okay, there's media. We're down one more mountain. We've got three mountains to go. I'm going to try to hit family and religion before 720. This next one is very short. Okay, mountain of family. The mountain of family has been under assault like never before. There's a foundational fracturing of the family unit. When a family unit is fractured, it creates fractured community which then creates fractured nations. When you know the authority and responsibility given to you when you are wearing your uniform in the spirit as an ambassador of the king, there is an exponential increase of the release of favor and potential that can take place through your life. Angels will be assigned to you to assist you because you are now just not just living for yourself or to survive, but you now understand that where you live and walk is your mission field and platform. Okay, our, great, our most important place of ministry is in our home. It is not to be separate from our ministry life. It is our ministry life. It is our number one ministry life is in our home. If we can't get it right in our home, we can't get it right anywhere else. And if we're trying to do it right somewhere else and we don't have it right in our home, it will all fall apart. So our home is the most important. If we can't make disciples of our own children and nieces and nephews and grandchildren and all that, we, should, we have no place trying to make disciples else, anywhere else. These are the people that are around us all the time, and if they don't, are not drawn to God through our life, then what's wrong with us? It's a lot easier to disciple strangers from a distance <laughs> because they don't see you. But the family is the people that see us, and if we're not impacting them, we have no business being out other places. There's so a lot of things I like to do, but I'm, I'm choosing not to do them until my kids are grown up. Some things I'll do, but I'm not going to neglect my children. I've got to be there for them because it's, it's, that's, that's the proof <laughs> that what I'm saying, what I'm doing what is really, really uh, for real or not. So the coming Elijah revolution, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the world with a curse. You know, just thinking about that, I, I've heard, known people, seen stories. Sometimes the most wicked people in the world can love their children like no one else, will die for their kids, will stand up for their kids. And they could be doing the most evil things in the world, mobsters, gangsters, all kinds of stuff, yet they love their kids like nothing else. That's like what people do. If you're, you know, in some kind of criminal activity, what do they go after? They go after their family because that's the thing, the only thing that affects them. Yeah. And yet we'll have Christians that will neglect their children because of ministry. Whoa. Does that make any sense? <laughs> what mountain is health care on? Okay. If we were to isolate 
one mountain, it would be the mountain of family, perhaps 90% of all illnesses come directly or indirectly from fractured families. Never heard that statement before, that's kind of, wow. Our healing ministries are at the bottom of all seven mountains with giant eraser, erasing the consequences of the fact that principalities have been unchallenged. The tops of all the mountains are releasing toxic disease into society, which is why we will never have the success we would want in healing crusades. We have a healing ministry here, Pam knows. It's never reached the success we thought it would, right? Not yet. Not yet. This is part of the answer right here. Because it's, there's more to it than just having the service. Amen. There's more areas that had to be reached in order to bring a healing to the culture. That really brings healing to people. We must begin to write things into the fabric of a society that release healing. You know the power of a word, like we're just talking about media. When good news comes forth, healing is released. Power of words. That's a part of it. It opens the heart. It prepares the way for the healing to take place. There is attentively a simple strategy. Or sorry, being in health is when the systems of the world represent the face of God in every sector of society. Being in health. You know, actually the word health in the Greek, what is it? Um, Jehovah Rapha. Rapha. And that means whole. Wholeness. Means completeness. Means everything whole. So even, it means society being whole. Every area God wants to be whole, healed. His, his you know, heaven on earth, that's whole. There's a relatively simple strategy that the enemy has on every mountain. And it's our job to come in the opposite spirit of what the enemy is doing there. We are on the mountains not just to get people saved, but to heal structures. Yes. By representing the face of God there. You know, when you hear that, like issues that say racism, and you hear the word systemic. It needs to be systemic change. What, that's exactly what it's talking about. There's structure changes that have to take place to really see real change. And that's where you need government, because you need government people in position often to bring structure change, to change the laws, to redirect things. The spiritual landscape of the mountain of family, the enemy is the jib jibosites. They represent rejection. The demon that torments us so that Baal might take us. So the principality is Baal. Name means Lord of Jezebel. They work together. It's a spirit of perversion that's behind homosexuality, abortion, cutting oneself, etc. That's what they did when they worshipped the god Baal is they cut themselves. Cutting oneself as Baal worship, a visible manifestation of self-rejection. Eternalized self-rejection, self-hatred will often show up as an autoimmune disease. The people that are out there killing people are people who have been rejected. When you've been rejected enough, you lose your heart. Because you've lost your hope. And you just don't care anymore. 1 Kings 18.28, so they cried aloud and cut themselves, and that's really, just said me, that's really what's behind the Muslim religion, is out of um, Abraham and then Ishmael, Ishmael was rejected, and the spirit of rejection came upon all those people, and so they're anger and hatred towards Jews and towards Christians and towards all that and the gruesome killing that they're doing is coming from a spirit of rejection that's on them. Homosexuality is, or let me see, where am I? Cutting oneself is Baal worship, okay? The spirit of Elijah short-circuits the power of Baal. 
From the moment you're conceived, the enemy is attempting to wound you with rejection. If he can get his foot in the door with rejection or perceived rejection, then he has made a way for the principality of Baal to work against you. Seems like those who rejected you, you'll see, even I was at a show at Bar Borgata um, Friday, Saturday night. My son and my wife, we went out to see uh, Preacher Lawson, which was the comedian on um, America's Got Talent this year, who was one of the top guys, almost got knocked out, but he was a very clean comedian. Probably the, he's compared to Eddie Murphy in his style, not in his curse words. So. <laughs> But he's uh, amazing. But throughout the entire time of his, his comedy, you constantly heard, my father rejected me when I was born. Even when he ended, even though there was a lot of positive stuff throughout, but when it came down to it, he still was driven by the spirit of rejection. What was his name again? Preacher Lawson. So, you know, I even reached out to him, trying to connect with him. But, you know, you, hear, you see that, op if you open your eyes and see throughout media, movies, almost all entertainment, seems like it's all about brokenness with, their, with somebody's father being rejected. And why so many of us hurt often comes down to that. You know, if you didn't have somebody replace that, like I did with my grandmother, who took the place very quick at a young age, so that I did not feel rejected, I feel accepted by her love, <laughs> made a world of a difference. If he can get his foot in the door with re rejection or perceived rejection, then he has made a way for the principality of Baal to work against you. Homosexuality is Baal worship. Self-rejection has progressed to rejection of one's own sexuality. So that's really the root behind homosexuality is rejection. So remember, how do we help somebody? We opt in the opposite. The difficulty is being accepting of the individual without accepting the lifestyle. Because they mainly feel the ex ex non-accept, the rejection, the continual rejection. Most homosexuals feel, because uh, it's been out that way, of course it's been twisted, it's, uh, but most part, they've been rejected by most Christians. The church needs to come to a new level of understanding and anointing as it relates to those who struggle with homosexuality and what our role should be. There have been basically two branches of how to deal with the issue of homosexuality. Number one, someone to make it clear before the person even comes in that we have a standard of no homosexuality as it's sin. Therefore, the one place they should be able to bring healing is now making sure they can't because they already feel rejected by us. People walk right out the door. and some, so you, When you're already sensitive anyway because you've already been rejected so many other places, you can sense it real quick. And so we're not on point as a body. It just takes one person. That's the difficulty. You know, people leave all the time because they don't feel right. I remember just quick, uh, we had there was an individual who's come to a gay group and he's come to church. He got back to the state and um, he was coming to the church and he was just one person who was in leadership. takes one person. We've already been hurt a lot. And so we have to teach everyone how to accept the individual without accepting the lifestyle. And, you know, when is the right time to begin to deal with? The best time to start dealing with the sin is when person is starting to feel convicted about the sin. That's when they're open because they're asking, I'm not feeling right doing this suddenly anymore. After you fall in love with Jesus. Yeah, that will be part of it. When you fall in love with Jesus, automatically certain things you did just don't feel right anymore. And so uh, that's when we can now help guide them out of it. 
And that's a difficult thing to be okay with the process until the right timing. To know God's timing is what it really is. Not to be okay with the lifestyle, but to be okay with God's timing. That all of us have sinful issues that we battle with that don't just disappear overnight. Mm -hmm. And issues of rejection go deep down and do not heal for most people overnight in one healing service or one um, inner healing um, experience. You know, it's a process that takes time and we got to be willing to go with people and to hold their hand through that process without rejecting them. And that's a hard thing to do, and we hardly have an opportunity to even do this because most homosexuals don't, will not even come near a church because of what is expected of how people feel, you know? So number two, we must understand the heart of Jesus and reflect it as the church. He was a friend first, and the standard came later. We don't need to broadcast our position or homosexual looking for the love of Christ won't want to walk into our church. Some have tried to get free and can't, so they change the biblical standard and accept those with homosexuality as being okay. We must access greater anointing to free homosexuals so they have hope for change based on our success. Abortion as Baal worship. Self-rejection has advanced to rejection of one's own continuity, your child which is an extension of yourself. So what's behind abortion? Rejection. It's hard to bring in somebody else in the world when you yourself have been rejected. It's hard to accept bringing forth a life. So we look down upon those who have committed abortion, not understanding what they've been through. And bringing healing to them so that it doesn't happen again. Jeremiah 32, 35 says, And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Molech. This abomination to cause Judah to sin. The mantle of a pastor is available to those called to the mountain of family. And each of us are in a family. So we're all called to have the grace of a pastor. You know, and every church should have a pastor <laughs> where we can receive grace from as well. But we're called to have that grace in our home because our children need. Pastors bring acceptance. They accept. They love unconditionally. They go out of the way to help. They're concerned. They care. They give care. The important role of pastors Female pastors, marketplace pastors, government services pastors, judges who are pastors, lawmakers who are pastors. The heart of the Father is that his sons and daughters would fill the mountain of family and bring practical strength, restoration, and healing in every way. Psalm 68, 5-6 says, A father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. So dealing with rejection, number one, you may have agreed with a lie, your perception at the time. Number two, rejection's poison stays active in you until you forgive the rejector. It's still alive in everyone that hasn't really forgiven. Forgiveness is about giving yourself the freedom to move on. Rejection is an opportunity to be fast-forwarded into the purposes of God in your life. If you properly handle rejection, this is how you can see, and you know somebody's ready for leadership. I have a young man that was rejected for what he felt like he stood up for. He felt like he was in the right. And for doing that, he was rejected. And there were some ways possible that he was in the wrong. But bottom line, he's young and zealous. And that what I'm looking for is how he's going to handle this rejection. So I'm trying to coach him and guide him so that through it, it's actually going to take him higher than ever before. Because you've got to handle rejection and leadership or you're not going to make it. <laughs> not going to make it far. You're going to step one step in and you're right out the door. So we got to handle rejection. So the only way we're going to handle rejection is first of all, we got to make sure we've sought healing 
through forgiveness, our own healing, through forgiving everyone that has hurt us, that has rejected us, whoever that person might be, our parents, our um, family members, friends, wherever it was, whoever rejected us, we have to heal. And we have to, the only way that can happen is we choose to forgive and then God sets us free and heals us and now we're moving forward and now we can step into our destiny. So I think this is one of the main reasons why a lot of church folks are really in the crowd, not in the game, are not true disciples of the Lord, they're just believers. It's because they have not yet freed themselves from rejection. And that's why there's such a problem in the church of homosexuality. It's hidden. Some people are in the church battling it, but they're never going to bring it out because they're going to be rejected. <laughs> and I've seen it in our youth ministry, the years I was there, all kinds. It's a major issue, and it's because of rejection. There is a ministry in Philadelphia called Harvesters that deals strictly with homosexuality. It also serves as a resource for churches to yeah. be More compassionate. More compassionate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we might eventually have to do workshops to prepare, you know. We, I mean, it's simple. You know, be filled with the love of Jesus. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who gives us a right to hate somebody because of one sin over another sin, you know, to dislike them. It's to make disciples. That takes time, and it takes community, and it takes love, and it takes kindness. And I think we just don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, it's inconvenient. Discipleship means... I gotta take my time That's right. to serve others. Uh -huh. People don't want to do that. It's inconvenient. That's right. yep. I got too much to do. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's painful sometimes, and even as the leader, sometimes you experience rejection. You put in so much time, and then the person leaves. But you know, as leaders, Jesus stays there for us. He never turns his back on us. Yep. So it's like you know, it's really in the leadership. I think. Yeah. We've got to get to the point that, you know, am I going to lay down my life? Am I going to deny myself? Yeah. And, if, and if we don't, and we think it's because we're so busy, God won't have a problem telling us, uh, yeah, it really did nothing <laughs> when it came down to it. When we go to glory, oh, uh, there's not really much of a reward for you. You didn't do nothing. You weren't discipling nobody. Mm -hmm. All the things you were doing really meant nothing for eternity. So we've got to make sure what we're doing is of eternal value. Yeah. And, um, and that's why, you know, we think, uh, you know, our job is taking away our time for ministry. But we have to understand that who God's assigned us to disciple is on our job. That's right. <laughs> that's right. We have so much hours, just like in our home. Our main time is consumed at home and on our job. And people are longing for ministry, not realizing that the people to disciple is right in their home yeah. and right on their job because that's the majority of the hours you spend. And then you won't even think much about church. It'll just be a little nice little time to get equipped and then go back. And people are so caught up in what goes on in church, not caught up in what's supposed to be going on in their family. And when you're caught up in what's going on in your family and on your job and with a kingdom mindset, what happens in church isn't as big of a deal. Yeah. It's still important. <laughs> so hallelujah it's break time I think last couple ones I missed our mission on the mountain of family fill the mountain with the pastorally hearted those who heal reject those who have been healed from rejection at every possible juncture some will have a structural mission institutions and laws that protect family and give financial incentives to its well-being so you might be called to the mountain of family, but because of the issues in the family, the laws need passed, you might have to go through the government to deal with the family. There's some other area. You know, because of what's going on in the media and how it's affecting the family, you might be in the media because you're called to the family. Right. See how it works together? Or education, <laughs> religion, <laughs> arts and entertainment, basically every one of these. Family is big time affected by the economy. So every one of these things really hits the family. That's, that will take a seven minute break. Mountain of religion. We're gonna zoom through this one because we've talked enough about religion all our life. <laughs> no, here we go. 
mountain of religion. The, there will be continuing revelation coming to you and to God's people. The central premise is that he is the bigger than God with the better than plan. He is more than enough and he has full attention to fill the whole earth with the knowledge of his glory. He will fill, the, and this is one thing we've got to understand. I was just talking with my sister here. You know, God has all the answers to every problem in the world. The world is trying their best to solve problems. And the world tackles things in, a, in this mode, as my sister was telling me, the how-to. They're all about how do you do it. They're proactive. And often Christians are reactive. Like some governments are reactive. We step in only when we have to. And so we need to learn to become proactive. So the mountain that you're called to, we're knowing, we're getting the understanding, the knowledge, the importance of reaching these mountains. But now your job as an individual who's in those mountains is to say, God, how do I do it? And those are things every day. You're going to have opportunities every day that come at you, problems that are around you. And now your job is to not just see the problem, but to now ask God about the problem. Because he knows how to solve it. And when you begin solving problems, you become a force to be reckoned with. And you, have, you now become a fear of the enemy. Once you become a fear of the enemy, you're going to have opposition. But that's when life gets exciting. You ever seen life exciting? Read about the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul had a pretty exciting life. Why do none of us have exciting lives like Paul? Maybe none of us are... No, I'm not saying none of you are. But some of you might not be living as exciting as it can be. Because we've got to live like it was in the book of Acts. We've got to believe in God's power. We've got to demonstrate it. And we've got to be put in position where we're a threat to the enemy. The enemy doesn't want us to t take his territory, but the territory was already given us. And all we have to do is put his head under our feet. But how do we put his head under our feet if he's the one running things? The only way we can run things is if we can run things better. Because if everyone's serving Satan, not that they know it, they're not going to change serving Satan unless somebody can do it better. So our God does everything better. <laughs> our God is greater. We can say all we want to make America great again. If God is not on the throne, it won't be any greater. God alone has to be on the throne of each of our lives for God to be greater in us and through us. And so he will fill the mountains with his glory and they will function again as they did in the garden as we restore his face in society. The reformation of society will happen as we reform the face of God to society. One of the main things that need to be reformed before we can... Re really, it's a transformation of society... And it begins with a reformation of the church. We have started some level of reformation from Martin Luther on, but we really haven't arrived yet. I just got introduced uh, from this, the Korean pastor I was telling you about last week that um, me, Ms. Rahi knows, new Korean of the Korean church here, and he was telling me about this um, minister from Denmark and his movie called The Reformation Movie. Really, really good. But it's really challenging because we really haven't gone hardly anywhere in this reformation process. Because if you look at the book of Acts, predominantly, especially here in America, the church ain't nothing like it. We don't really believe in God. We don't have signs and wonders following us every day. Just a few people. So we need a reformation because the real battle between this understanding going forward into the church and it being accepted, tradition. I was on the radio, I told you this week, dealing with, um, thank you, thank you, dealing with the future of religion in America. And I started talking about the seven mountains a little bit. And 
what I found was with one of the pastors, and he wasn't disrespectful in any way, but um, I knew that, you know, the understanding of most people is that the church has been doing things just fine, and the only reason the world is rejecting is because they're rejecting Christ. It's not by how we've been doing things, that how we've been doing things isn't good. They, we need to go back to the way it was, more than anything else. But what it's saying is, the real issue is an eschatology problem. It's the rapture mindset. This rapture mindset was really only brought forward in the 20th century. Before that time, really wasn't there. This whole mindset that you know, the church is just going up and God's going to take us out. And once things get really bad, so we just sit around and let things get really bad so Jesus can come back soon. And we just let everything go. And that's really the issue. And that's the easiest way, you know, just do nothing, <laughs> you know, do nothing and sit and watch it rot. You ever told kids to clean your room and they just don't do it and sit there or they tuck it under the bed or they do whatever? Because that's the church way. Let's just neglect it, forget it, and just be taken up, you know, and uh, it's not going to work. And so there needs to be a reformation of the church. Why were the, beginning, the, the early church so active and out in the marketplace and seeing signs, wonders, miracles all the time? Why did Paul get called to minister to the elite, the leaders? And, and, because it was all about changing structure. It began with making disciples, but then those disciples would now disciple nations. And so we've lost that somewhere where the focus isn't discipling nations, it's just having church. And now all it's all about is what we can do in those two hours that we meet every week. And not about what everyone else is doing all those other hours during the week. So there really needs in this whole religion mountain a reformation of going back to what we're really called to and what we're supposed to be doing. And what it means to really believe. That, and that movie was showing, which I thought was so cool, when somebody gets baptized in water, you don't just dunk them under the water and let them come up. You make sure when they come up, they're filled with the Holy Ghost and that every demon comes out of them. They were getting delivered in the water. Because I think people are getting saved and then maybe getting healed way down the line. Then maybe getting delivered way up down the line. It's like we can't really go on because we really haven't even began. Because so many of us have, some of us are hardly saved, yeah. hardly healed, hardly delivered. So therefore, we're in no place to be going up those mountains. We got so much inner problems, issues within ourselves. So we got to start back in the beginning and make sure that all of our members are truly saved, healed, and delivered and have it done quick. And then they're like, okay, forget about me. I, God, what do you, what, where have you called me to? What's my assignment? What's my purpose? What's my reason that you saved me for and healed me and delivered me? And now we can start getting somewhere and moving. So reformation in the church. The enemy is the parasite, represents idolatry so a lot of parasites in the mountain of religion parasites let's call it the principality is the religious spirit like I say the false religious spirit the worship thief or false worship operates by idols or tradition or quenching the holy spirit the holy spirit is our weapon i think that's what's not been utilized the person of the holy spirit are we operating without the Holy Spirit? The purpose, the person, because it said, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon us, and then therefore we would now be witnesses. Witnesses of what? Witnesses of Jesus. That means we can expect, if we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, the works of Jesus is evident in our life. If it's not evident in our life, we have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll see the person of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the character of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, His power, His love, and then the structure of the Holy Spirit as well. That's one thing people like to forget, that part. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a spirit of it brings structure in our lives, order, discipline. When Jesus left us, He left us the Holy Spirit, not the Word. He discipled them, but still insisted they wait for the Holy Spirit to fill them. 
as awesome as the word is, the Bible kills without proper understanding through the Holy Spirit. When someone tries to interpret the scripture without Holy Spirit, what they receive is a spirit of religion. And that's where a lot of our churches are. You'll get filled with something when you go in there. But you might, I don't know, I, I'd rather be, I enjoyed sin more than I would enjoy being just totally religious. There was, there was a reason why I was young and I didn't want nothing to do with the Catholic Church. I wanted to get out of there as soon as my grandma gave me the permission to say no, to not have to get up early and go to church. I was, no way. Would I want to just live my life that way? If I'm going to be in this thing, it got to be different than that. So we're, we're not trying to repeat the great inquisition where Christians have dominion. Did I miss those lines? Oh, Holy Spirit, it is. God cared less than we got the right books of the Bible than he did what we received the Holy Spirit. So many people are so caught up in what Bible version you're reading and what, um, you know, so much about the Bible, fighting about what the Bible really says, interpret it this way. When you fill with the Holy Ghost, you just figure it out. You just get it. The Bible, it don't matter what translation is not, in most translations, or God, Holy Spirit will reveal his revelation to you. Because it's so much more than just what's on the page. There's revelation. Holy Spirit brings revelation. We're not trying to repeat the great inquisition where Christians have dominion. We're not trying to impose the kingdom through rule. This is about influence coming through the character of the king. If you want the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you hang out with the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit that we gain authority on the mountain of religion. The mountain of religion is where we understand that our assignment is that souls be saved and that false religions be confronted and proven to be false. The four great religions, Christianity, 2.2 billion, 700 million filled with the Holy Ghost. So it's really basically 700 million. Because I don't know about the others. I truly don't. I don't know if you can be saved and not be filled with the Holy Spirit and really be saved. Islam, 1.2 billion. Because if you're not open to being filled with the Holy Spirit and you got saved, what did you really get saved for? Unless you just don't know. You know, Islam, 1.2 billion. Hinduism, 900 million. Buddhism, 400 million. So those are the four great religions. Other significant religions, there's various Chinese religions, 350 million, such as Confucianism. I like that word, Confucianism. Yeah. Various African religions, <laughs> animism and all that, 100 million. You know, this is an amazing thing. Talking about African-American, I was... Speaking with the bishop, Dandy, this week, he had me on the radio and he was enlightening me about, you know, often African Americans reject Christianity because, you know, it was enforced upon them in slavery, not knowing, and then so they return, and that's a big message, especially in prisons, to get young African American men to become Muslims, not knowing that the Muslims were the first people to bring slavery in North Africa to the Western African people. So before Christians did slavery, because a lot of them were those who, conf or at least professed Christianity, um, Muslims did it before then. So really Christianity goes much deeper and you can really look at Af uh, Africans and the people that came down into Africa were directly connected to Abraham and to Israel, it's the true religion of all of us, <laughs> including African Americans, really the beginning was with Abraham and Noah and Noah's sons. And Noah's sons came down and went to different places. And so if we want to go back to the beginning, our root, if we're looking for identity, it will be found in Noah's sons. That's who went down to Africa. So Christianity would be <laughs> the true Judaism, which was of that time, but God would be the person to seek. So that was a pretty cool thing to learn, though. How the religious spirit steals worship. Overt Satanism, direct thievery, very little success. Okay, idolatry, indirect worship, 
thievery, he positions himself behind the idol. The idol is his mask. Demons are empowered by the beliefs of people. They are only strong when they deceive people. Our assignments allow truth to reign to break down the argument that sustains a stronghold, weakening the principalities. You know, these gods don't like to be exposed, these false religions. I remember my wife telling me, you know, I didn't get experience, but when she was in Guyana, a lot of Hinduism is in Guyana, and uh, they were doing deliverance. Actually, I did see deliverance in this village way out in Guyana, and um, the manifestation was so, so people, you'd see heads in people's stomachs, you know, faces and all kinds of stuff, and often they were Hindu or Buddhists or Hindus, and uh, they really, it's pretty crazy. But doctrines that diminish Holy Spirit's work, crafty theological treatises that reduce the Holy Spirit's influence. And people can make themselves sound very good in their doctrine. And especially when they add the Greek and Hebrew words. Go into the deep stuff. And you're like, whoa, that person really knows what he's talking about. He might be releasing a doctrine of demons. <laughs> How to gain authority on this mountain. John 4, 23, 24. But this hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such. So we don't know the truth. We can't worship the Father in spirit. He is not just seeking worship. He's seeking true worshipers. The fact that there are true worshipers means that there can be false worshipers who do not worship in spirit and truth who are acting and their hearts and minds are not in it. False worship is worship that is inauthentic. Some people actually believe when they come to church, they're bored with worship because they really think they're just singing songs. <laughs> Some people skip worship so they, because they don't want to sing songs. They don't like the song style. Maybe they like country music and they, so, or whatever. It's crazy stuff that how could, I don't believe we can be saved if we have that kind of mindset. It's just automatic. When you get saved, you fall in love with Jesus and you want to worship him. It goes way beyond singing songs and that's just part of a time to be intimate with the Lord, to hear his voice and to get close to him, to get free from distractions, allowing him to minister to us individually. It's intimacy. It's, you know, if you get married, you, you know, you get, you're intimate with your spouse. If you get saved with G to Jesus, you're intimate with Jesus and that's what worship really is. And if you don't get that, it can never, you never really married him. Who doesn't, you know, who gets married and doesn't get intimate? Jezebel is the principality on the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment, or I'd rather say the Jezebel characteristics. One of the reasons Jezebel has so much power on the mountain of religion is because we're often, too, we're often acting rather than worshiping in spirit and truth. We're often acting rather than worshiping. Therefore, she has access to our hearts. You know, it's a form of godliness, but denying the, para, the power thereof. We're worshiping with, with words, but not from our heart. And a lot of the demonic activities, I've been studying this in depth of recently. You know, we see the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of this one and the spirit of that one. You know, Satan cannot operate in more than one person at a time. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. There's only one spirit that can be one spirit in many people, and that's the Holy Spirit. Every other spirit we see in the Bible describes characteristics, the deaf and dumb spirit, because it causes people to be deaf and dumb. It's just describing the type of spirit that is. The Jezebel spirit doesn't mean the spirit is actually named Jezebel, but that Jezebel spirit is like Jezebel that we see in the Bible, characteristics of Jezebel. So if somebody says, you know, if you see somebody with a person that's like Jezebel, then you could see, as you see in the Bible, Jezebel um, would try to control, manipulate, and kill the prophets and all that. And I've often seen in the charismatic church that almost anybody that has any kind of controlling thing is the spirit of Jezebel. But all of us in our flesh want to control our life, and we can all be in our flesh at times. And so we can act like Jezebel. The demons can try to lead us in that path of being like that person. 
But the spirit of Jezebel, that level, was at a position of high power in government and was killing prophets <laughs> and was at a whole nother, whole nother place. But there can be characteristics somewhat like. So I would rather not call spirits except for what they're like. So we've got to be very cautious because it can be very divisive. Yes. So that's a whole other topic and we'll never get done. The preeminent, oh, let me go. Okay, up to the top right there. Understanding idolatry. Idol, an object of adoration, an image of something, a false god, a pretender, an imposter. Idolatry is the intense admiration of something or someone who should not be an object or adoration. A pastor can become an idol. Church can become idolatry. When we overemphasize church more than these, our assignment, when our assignment all becomes what takes place in these four walls and not what we're doing out there, it's become idolatry. It's taken too much, too far of an extreme in our life. It is spiritual adultery. If you magnify a God that brings destruction, you get destruction. When you magnify, you make room for the very thing an idol claims to provide are protection and provision, and those are the very things they take away. The more idolatrous a nation or region is, the more deprived of provision and protection they will be. The preeminent role of the Holy Spirit on the mountain of religion, the person of the Holy Spirit, knowing the God of presence. The gift of the Holy Spirit, knowing the God of power. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, knowing the God of character. The structure of the Holy Spirit, intentionality. Okay, let's look at the impact of the Holy Spirit. In 1900, there was one in 27 born-again Christians. In 2010, there was one in four in the world. Christian, but truly born again, maybe one in five. Of those, again, around 700 million are charismatic Pentecostal, third wave, or one in ten in the world. There's been a progressive growth in understanding the work of the Holy Spirit over the last hundred years to the degree that the expansion of his work has been understood. To that degree, the kingdom has exploded. The great church growth happened around the world is happening in conjunction with making room for the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is key. I can't imagine being part of a church without the Holy Spirit. It's dead. It's a doornail. It just needs to be shut down. And removed because it's a mockery of the Lord. It's an idol. It's an idolatry. It's a false religion. If we have Holy Spirit out of it, there's no understanding of the truth. There's no revelation. And there's just works of the flesh. Without Holy Spirit, there's no works of the Spirit. There's no fruit of the Spirit. There's works of the flesh. So, uh, a new measure of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.17. And it shall come to pass that in the last days God will pour out my spirit in all flesh. The whole world is our congregation. There is no secular anything. And I, I need to remove that from my language. I say it too much. We need to stop using the word secular. In God's, in the kingdom, there is no secular anymore. God wants to reign and rule in everything. He is a God that wants to show up in every sector of society. He's not intimidated by any level of technology that exists. He's a way ahead of us and is not intimidated by any battle, any challenge, any sector of society. He's willing to give us an answer and solution for every sector of society. We're called to supernaturally solve the problems of society. Everyone else in the world is trying to solve it naturally. You get to use your supernatural grace. Your superheroes, you know, really believe it. <laughs> You have supernatural abilities that nobody that does not know God, they don't have. So you got an advantage, and we got to see ourselves that way. If young kids would think, man, if I could just be Batman for a day, if I could just be Superman for a day, if I could just have Jesus Christ in me for a day, and yet we have Jesus Christ in us for eternity, the greatest superhero with the greatest powers, the one that walked on water, that feed 5,000, that raised the dead, that did all these things are in us, and what are we doing with it? What are we doing with him? What are we doing with the power of the Holy Spirit? Why aren't we using it? That was really what that movie Reformation was. It was just people on the streets using the power of the Holy Spirit, seeing signs and wonders, proving to people that God is real because of his power. 
And not just showing power by healing people, but then leading them into salvation and leading them into healing and deliverance and bap being baptized in water. So if we just use the supernatural power, if every one of us that used the supernatural power, even just in this room, because Jesus just took 12 initially, and he shook, took, shook the world upside down. So all nations will praise him. Isaiah 62, 2, and give him no rest till he establishes and he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. Okay, next mountain is the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment. It's another very important mountain. Of course, all the mountains are very important, but again, the areas that vision and ears and eyes have a very effect on what's inside of us and how we think. As we begin to be in tune with what God is doing on planet Earth, we're going to see the host of heaven invading Earth, and we get to be a part of it. The angels do the heavy lifting, and they are the difference makers. This is the dominant mountain of culture in the world. If you are at the top of this mountain, you are known and accepted in every other sector of society. So much influence is in that mountain of arts and entertainment, and yet it's so easy to be corrupted. But if we can raise up people anointed, like this young lady that danced um, Sunday, you know, I didn't know where she came from. I've seen her, but I didn't know she had that ability. There she was dancing with an anointing and power. Now, if we can cradle that and make sure she can separate herself from the world and, and just focus on God, then God can use those gifts to make a difference. But so many people that are on this mountain were raised in the church, and often those gifts are rejected, and they use those gifts now for evil. They get corrupted. Psalm 1611 says, You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at the right hand are pleasures forevermore. People love to be entertained. Entertainment is something that for either good or bad, is a big part of all of our lives. Yeah. Hmm. Enter in men. Wow. That's... Yeah. Enters in. Yeah. It's a big gate. Enter. Got to watch what we allow to enter into our gates. But people are, going, people are drawn to entertainment. People like to be entertained, and that's so we need to fill this mountain with godly entertainment. So I'm believing that you know, Atlantic City is an entertainment city. So it draws people to be entertained. So my prayers and my hopes are all the turmoil that's been going on in that city, that it will be turned into a godly entertainment city. You know what? I was hoping that Revel would be not a casino who bought it out, but it looks like it's going to be at least a resort casino. But the focus is a little bit more on the resort side, I'm hearing. And so the casino side, that's not the best, but it's not the worst. So hopefully the city is turning towards a resort community rather than a casino community. And I think they have no choice. They just got to wake up to that reality. And they haven't waken up to that reality yet. So some people are trying to hold on to the casino industry, even though that's not going to work anymore because casinos are all over the place and it's just not going to be a sell anymore. But um, entertainment, is e it is, and some of the casinos, such as Tropicana, is focused a little bit more on the family side of things, having more of a variety in their establishment. And they're, uh, whenever I go over there, which I go over there quite often, I like to hang out. <laughs> no, I go there because of the IMAX. But it's filled with people all the time. People of all ages, all backgrounds, having a good time. People love to have a good time. So if God is the source of good news, God's a source of eternal life, God created fun, created humor, created all the arts and gifts and grace, shouldn't we be the one leading in this area? So we need to get about it. Get about it. So where am I? Okay. Uh, his creativity was those two lines, if I missed those. Who is the enemy on this mountain? The enemy is the Hivites. Represents perversion or counterfeit. Perversion means a misinterpretation. 
Counterfeit means made in an imitation with intent to deceive. So it's one of the biggest areas of where the enemy works for deception. Genesis 1 introduces us to God as creator. Our God is a compulsive creative, and he keeps showing different dimensions of himself, which is why he wants you to be, he wants you, to be you and not somebody else. So entertainment can often cause people to try to be somebody else because we like what we're watching, so we want to be what we're watching. So people look up to sports athletes, to singers, to, media, to entertainers, to Hollywood people, movie actors and all that, and you look up to them, you want to be like them. So they're, you know, a lot of people are just not themselves. They have an identity crisis because they're trying to be what they see rather than be who they are. So it'd be great to have... In this mountain, people with the creativity, how to help people be who they are, how to bring the best out of people would be the best way to approach this mountain. There could be so many counterfeits that people don't want the real. The enemy produces counterfeits, so we won't accept the real. We don't want supernatural experiences, tongues, dance, etc., because it sounds too much like the counterfeit. We're just left, let's just, you know, let's just avoid it altogether, so, you know. We want to make sure things don't get out of hand. And we want to make sure, you know, nothing bad happens. And so we'll just stay boring, tiny, insignificant. Make sure no young people want to be in our church. Is how boring we are. How much the world is way ahead of us in everything. And that's why we don't have a lot of young people. And if we're going to get young people, we're going to have to do things a lot differently. Yet the power of the Holy Spirit got to be in it all. <laughs> and young people want the real. They're all about the real. I'm telling you, one of the best ways I was seeing, watching that movie, I see a lot of young people are easy drawn to that. You go out there and you do the real? You bring signs and wonders and power? And they see it? You want a way to disciple a young person? Take them on the streets and release healing and miracles to people and let them watch for a little bit and then now tell them to do it. They're going to want to be in this thing. If they see God work through them, they're going to start believing it. This is how they operate. They've got to see that it's real. They're all about, they learn in school, you know, everything got to be proven. Science, all that teaches them that. So if God can be seen and witnessed through power, better chance they're going to follow. Words ain't enough. Demonstration of power has to be it. The challenge we have of reaching this younger generation, because the future of America is not good regarding decline. It's all about the, real, the ages. Young people are no longer going to church. Every generation's reducing. And the way we're going, there will be nobody left. And um, by 2035, it's predicted that there'll be 38% of people claiming to be nuns, which means they don't believe in anything. And most of those people are young people. The awesome opportunity is now we can do things right. Now we've got to say, okay, we're either going to die or we're going to become alive. <laughs> And if we choose to become alive, we're going to start doing things a lot differently. And our services will be filled with the power of God. And not just the services, our lives will be filled with the power of God. Amen. Demonstration will be seen and young people will be like, oh my, God is real. <laughs> so that's our choice. We either make this thing real or we die out in America. The Hivites, Genesis 34, 1-2, the Hivite violated her. Dinah went out to the world, and the Hivite raped her. Joshua 9.4, they worked craftily and pretended. Judges 3.3, the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, that which brings fragrance to the temple. So, okay. The principality, Jezebel-like spirit, means unchaste, or Baal is husband. Represents lust or seduction. This spirit misinterprets, perverts, and counterfeits all celebratory pleasure, specifically so that we will do without. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And makes sex an uh, object. And then you know why people are obsessed with it? Because it's never satisfying. It can never reach what they're looking for. Because it can only be done one way, and that's God's way, to find pleasure forevermore. To find where, you know, compared to what I have in Christ, 
in that area cannot compare to what I did when I was in the world. Because in Christ, things are just... <laughs> and in the world, it's... And so people would just know how good God is and what God wants to bless us in all areas of life. So perversion, all that. Jezebel and the prophetic. Jezebel-like spirit and the prophetic. Revelation 2.20 this spirit who calls herself a prophetess, prophets under the spirit of Elijah, must be on this mountain. It is the prophetic which accesses the supernatural creativity of God. The prophetic has the anointing to bring out the individual in somebody. The prophet calls people out, calls their gifting out, calls their assignment out, helps clarify their assignment and calling. That's what media and entertainment is supposed to do. You're supposed to be watching something like, oh my, that's what I'm called to do. It just brings it out, allows you to see it, clarifies things. Michael's an artist. When you look at Michael's art, it brings out identity, it speaks to you. That's what it's supposed to do. The mantle of prophet is available for those who are called to the celebrate, mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment. You're called to be a prophet under the spirit of Elijah that works against the spirit of Jezebel. The kingdom of God advances. Not when people get saved, but when the spirit he desires begins to manifest on that mountain. The spirit advances, not when people get saved. I mean, the kingdom advances. The kingdom advances when we get saved and start moving with God in our assignment into the territory that's put us. The children of Israel did not advance by just coming out of Egypt. They advanced only when they stepped into the promised land. That's when they began to take land the picture for the prophetic is an eagle. Oh, I missed the other underline, which is manifested. His purity and his creativity must be manifested in order for Satan to be pushed back on the mountain of celebration. Art is a way for a release of the Holy Spirit's manifestation. When you're really working with the art and God's Holy Spirit's leading you, such as Teresa is playing worship, as you're worshiping and the Holy Spirit is all in it, manifestation's being released. When we do an art, manifestation can come out of that art. A movie, manifestation come, can come out of that movie. I've experienced, the, you know, before I was saved, right before I saved, I'm telling you, there was an anointing on the movie Braveheart. Because when I was watching it, there was a work being done in me that began to open my heart and pave the way for me to go down the path towards salvation. There's, that's the power of movies. The picture for the prophetic is the eagle. Eagles can go up higher, see further, and access things others cannot. As sons and daughters, you can hear things they can't hear and see things they can't see because you have a relationship with the king. The only true source of creativity. Powers and principalities cannot be creative. As long as you're not with the, in the creator, the creator is not the one guiding you. Everything that you create is distorted is a misrepresentation, is a counterfeit. First Chronicles 25.1. You know, you, get, you buy clothes, you think, you know, you buy it from a certain place. Oh, man, that's a... Let's just use Levi's, though I don't wear Levi's, but... See, Levi's a store, man, it's only $15. It's normally $45. You pick it up, you go... But then you wash it a couple times, and it don't look good anymore. Why? Because somebody tried to counterfeit it. They didn't know how it was really made. They tried to do it their own way. The counterfeit is never as good as the original. First Chronicles 25.1, moreover, moreover, David separated for the service some of the sons of Asap who should prophesy with harps, string instruments, and cymbals. Everything created prophesies on its own. It sound and looks prophesies. Second Chronicles 5.11-14, through 14, when the trumpets and the singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, the glory of the Lord filled the house. A picture prophesies, thank, bless you, what takes a thousand words to say. A picture prophesies what takes a thousand words to say. What most messages that are remembered, even by what I've spoken over the years, are messages in which I had some kind of um, symbol, symbolic act, or some kind of demonstration, or some kind of something visual that you see. Visual is so important for it to lock into our memory. 
So if we want to really impact people with our words, we have to have something that is visual for it to be remembered. Amen? Yes. Mm-hmm. And so the stained glass windows told the story of the Gospels. Mm. So modern day prophetic art are modern day stained glass windows. Yeah, well, that's cool. That's great. Love that. I just had, actually had somebody telling me, somebody who's a little older and maybe from a more traditional background, telling me, why do we have these prophetic paintings up on the wall? Can't we just keep them down? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness but anyway in order to show the world something they haven't seen we must see something they can't see so those two underlines right there show and see in order to show the world something they haven't seen we must see something they can't see people love to see something they haven't seen yet people get tired of the same old thing you know often most of the movies out there are just remakes of other movies that were previously done in a different way but usually you know and it's you have to go part number one, number two, number three, number four. You keep going. If we, God, people were in that place and we used, tapped into really the creativity power of God, we'd show the world things that they haven't seen yet. And it would be a draw. Have you ever heard of a citizen who is not allowed to go to the city they're from? We have access to heavenly strategy, revelation, and creativity. So if you're in this mountain, you're getting pretty excited right now. I mean, most of you already know this, but just get, hearing it again, it's like, what? We have a massive platform from which to proclaim God to the world. Seven Mountain Evangelism is where he will showcase his goodness in every sector of society that he is the desire of the nations. He is inviting us to partner with him. Anointed art releases that which is revealing. Anointed art reveals God, reveals who he is, his his power. All movies have a prophesying power, either positively or negatively. And a lot of movies, I was talking to a brother who's upstairs who's been watching, he's up in foundational, he's watching advanced classes, but um, he was showing me some things, concerns about the future and some of the technology out there and whatnot, but um, you know, a lot of what we're seeing in reality today is what was in the movies when we were children, right? The movies prophesy to the future. What the movies do, it creates creativity in young people who watch it. And those young people get obsessed with what they saw, so they begin to be creative in their minds, whether they know God or not. And all of a sudden, their creativity is getting down on paper, and they're beginning to process it and think it. Now they're getting older, and now they're beginning to bring it forth and shape it. In Silicon Valley, people like Bill Gates and those people, they grab a hold of young people, and some of them don't even have a degree or nothing, but they are creative, and they just put them in a room, and they start creating things, and give them a lot of money for it. So watch movies, and you'll see probably what's going to happen in the future, because that's what, that's what they're doing. Those on this mountain must manifest a different way of God thing, but we don't have to be, we can be concerned about it, yes, but at the same time, we can redeem those things once they're created, if those people find God. You're not advancing the kingdom of God on that mountain as long as you're falling under the Jezebel-like spirit. If you're called to the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment, God may have a more strict set of rules for you because you must protect your mission of purity in a unique way. So it's easy for those who are called into entertainment to be drawn into negative entertainment. You know? I had to be very careful with my son. My son loves comedy. He loves humor. So there's a lot of dark humor out there. I noticed as he was watching um, Preacher Lawson, who had a clean humor, that he wasn't laughing so much because he was used to dark humor. It took me a long time to begin to laugh because I used to watch late night BT comedy back in the 90s, which was very dirty. <laughs> and so it took me a while to be purified so I could enjoy 
clean comedy. Because there is good, clean comedy out there, a little bit. Even though I still like and live in color a little bit, but I'm not mess with you. If you call the mountain of celebration of arts and entertainment, God may... Okay, I said that. Last part here. When deep darkness comes, it's time to rise and shine. We are stealing hope and joy from our young people when we prepare them falsely for doom and gloom. The end days are about Jesus, his kingdom, his sons and daughters, knowing who he is and how he is, the fully nuanced God made manifest in all of society. The point is not just to get to the top, but also hold ground and maintain the presence of the king there. We must have armies going together. Amen. And we've got 10 minutes to finish the last part, which is short, kind of. So here we go. It's a lot. It's a lot to chew on. So I really encourage you, you know, you got your workbooks. Go home and chew on this, little by little, especially in the one that's your mountain. You got to chew on it. And more importantly, you got to pray about it. You got to know your mountain, but then you got to be in prayer about what to do on your mountain. And then it's a very important find other people that are in your mountain that you can pray with. So you can get a you can get strategy and wisdom from God how to bring the kingdom forth in that mountain. Okay, this last one is called extreme world makeover. That's what we're called to do. We're on extreme world makeover. People love makeovers. The TV series that have anything to do with house makeovers seem to go really well. So people like makeovers. We've been too long talking about doom and gloom, talking about the world being destroyed. Who wants to follow that? Who wants to be just following something that's going to be destroyed? Let's talk about the world being made over and being made better. You know, a lot of, especially young people, are all about being involved in social issues that make a difference in the world. What if we were the leading voices about those issues? Wouldn't young people be much more wanting to be involved rather than saying, hey, we're just, the earth's, you know, going to be destroyed soon. Come and join us. God is giving us an appetite and preparing us for extreme change in the world. Habakkuk 1.5 says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, you which would not believe, though it were told you. I like that. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, you which would not believe, though it were told you. This is the days, and you are the ones called to do that work. We're the ones, so now what do we got to do? Get to work. We've been sitting back on the sideline for too long, watching and looking, and not getting to work. We've been working, yeah, somewhat, a little bit here, a little bit there, but let's really get to work. Astounded means Hebrew tama, means brace yourself for shock. Let's believe that. We're going to be astounded this year by how far we go as the church. As the church, as his people, moving forward, advancing his kingdom, changing this area, South Jersey, let's believe that. We're going to be astounded of what change takes place in Atlantic County, in Atlantic City. God's people are just yeah. going to suddenly just get it. Yeah. Start getting it. If we just start getting it, things can change quickly. We're all on the bottom. We're like, my goodness, like the children of Israel looking at the promised land. It's too late. Look at those giants. They're too big. This just turn back. No, that's not our generation. We're the second generation of the children of Israel that say, okay, look what God's done before. Let's take on those giants because we're going to take them out. We're going to take them out. We're not going to compromise. We're going to take each one out, one at a time. Because Jesus says, I'm going to preach this Sunday, the final blow. And Joel's going to do a reggae song. It's going to be cool. The final blow. Jesus already did it. <laughs> he already did it. He already knocked the devil out. Yeah, we just got to enforce it. Right. Like Pharaoh, what did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh was knocked out. Basically, after his child was dead, he was knocked out. He let the people go. But then he decided, what am I doing? I'm not just finished here. Then he went after them. The devil keeps going after us. Uh-huh. Yet he's defeated. And we just got to, when he rises back up, let God sovereignly, like he did with the water, <laughs> and drowned him. 
this moment the devil puts his head back up, just let God drown him. So he is defeated. We just got to enforce. So our job isn't as big as it seems because God already did it on the cross. Just got to enforce it. We just got to believe who God says we are is who we really are. And the power that he's given us is the power we really have. And then start using it every day, all the time, wherever he's placed us. So Israel will be the anvil upon which the destinies of the nations will be formed. I was just watching Sid Roth before I came here. They had Chuck Pierce and a couple other prophets on there. And, you know, one thing, no matter what Trump does from here on, what he did that will be eternal value is by giving Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And what that released in the heavens were that released upon the earth and what change that will bring. To now because of that move, we can believe this word right here, astounded, can take place in America because of what just took place. Because every time something significant has happened with Israel, something significant has happened through the church in the spirit. So that's why we're going to have high expectation in 2018. And the years to come, really what was being spoken in those words I was hearing, especially 2020 is going to be a significant year. We're leading up to that. So we're going to see some awesome work. But in 2020 is where we're going to believe there's going to be a massive work of the Holy Spirit. When 2020 vision, when our eyes really become clear, we really start seeing things as God sees them, doing things as God does them. So nations are a drop in the bucket. Isaiah 40, 15, surely the nations are a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they are fine dust. What does that mean? Since they're just, God can change a nation like that. We need to get reconnected with the omnipotent power and sovereignty of God. The crooked places will be made straight. Isaiah 44, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. Those on top of those mountains will be brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. This is speaking of a work of justice, which means making crooked paths straight. He will do this in conjunction with his sons and daughters. And look at what we've already been seeing done for females. Justice is beginning to reign for females. All the hidden, dirty deeds done in secret are being exposed because God is healing women and bringing them to where they should be in society. And that is a work. Look at how, how could it happen just like that? How could there be one after another after another almost every day? Look at this. They allowed for years this gymnastic trainer in the U.S. Olympics to molest these girls over and over and over again to touch them all kinds of way and then just get exposed just like that. And it's just one out of so many. It's just, this is a God thing. It could not be any other way that there could be one after another all of a sudden, all at one time. It's a God thing. I will shake all nations. Haggai 2.7. This is part of that. Shaking. And I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. This is a good shaking that will cause nation to desire him. If God's mission were simply repentance, he could do it easily out of sheer fear. But he's going to showcase himself as the one with the answers and presence for every sector of society. Desire means, in Hebrew, chimda means delight, desire, pleasant, precious, goodly. We need to start seeing God as the desire of the nations. We were made, not the one who's going to destroy the nations, but the desire of the nations. We were made in his image. We are to see that image and reflect it into every sector of society. He is tired of being reflected as the finger pointing, judging God. Amen. When is the extreme world makeover finished? Isaiah eleven nine. 9. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be filled with not just the knowledge of God as Savior, but also the knowledge of the... See, the, not, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge. That means he has to fill every area of society. His knowledge says his knowledge shall fill 
every area. His way of doing things in every area of society. People say, you know, back this up in Scripture. How much more Scripture do we need? <laughs> We've gone through quite a bit of Scripture. The earth will be filled, not just knowledge of God as Savior, but also knowledge of the seven mountains, the God of all of life. He is all the things that we are often are not in the church. God's not going to tell us everything he's going to do, but he wants to tell us enough so that we will anticipate what we will do, what he will do, and be excited ahead of time. So the knowledge of his glory, the key of understanding the knowledge of his glory is in the, that underline is IPA. I'm going to break out what that means. To do the extreme world makeover, you've got to know your IPA. Number one, IPA, the I is identity. Yes, 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 yes. John, 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. So we've got to believe that. I am of God and I've already overcome them. I've already defeated the giants. Whatever mountain is I'm on, I am destined to be on the top yes. because I've overcome whatever is in front of me. 1 John 5, 4, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Number two, purpose. Got to know your identity. Secondly, you got to know your purpose. Revelation 4, 11, you have, you have created all things and... For your pleasure, they are all. For your pleasure, they are and were created. So you've got to know your purpose. What has God put before you? Our purpose is relational pleasure. And number three is assignment. So your IPA is your what? Identity, purpose, assignment. First John five seventeen because. As he is, so we are in the world. What was that? 1 John 5, 17, Because as he is, so we are in the world. As yes. who is? Yes. As he was. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus. So should we expect any different than what we read about here in our lives, through our lives? No, we shouldn't. If Jesus was able to make such an impact as one human being... How much more impact would be made in this world if every one of us were doing what he did? And even, what does it say? Even greater works. Because God is constantly doing greater. And so he wants to do greater in this generation than he ever did in any previous generation. We're not to be light. Some people are concerned with the word dominion. That's what they call this. They call it demonology or something like that. We're about, you know, dominion, making taken over rule, authority by physical. They call it kingdom now, teaching. And I don't believe we're in kingdom now. We're not in the millennial reign. Jesus is coming back. He will fully establish the work that we've done. He will complete the work we've done. It's not done yet. So... We do not believe in kingdom now, but we believe the kingdom is here and moving through us. And it will be fully established upon his return. This, um, we are not here to dominate people. We're here to dominate powers, principalities, darkness, and every work of Satan. That's who we're dominating. We're, again, enforcing Christ's reign upon the principalities of the world. Say, uh, when we get our IPA, we will do this daily. We must operate of, out of our identity, our purpose, and our assignment. Three stages of extreme makeover. Number one, awake. It's a big part. It's what revival usually does. Awake. Awakens us. Number two, arise. Reformation. Number three, shine. Transformation. If you don't know the movie script, you're a part of you are a part of, you will play the wrong role or have the wrong attitude. He has put us into a script where his glory will fall on all the nations. If I'm, as we're going to do our play again, if I forget that I'm Satan and try to be Jesus, and there's two Jesus, it'd be kind of off, wouldn't it? <laughs> it'd be kind of weird. We've got to know our role. got to know your part. Thank God I'm really not Satan. <laughs> it's got to play it in a part. 
So 2008, this is this prophetic picture of where we've come from. 2008 was a year of great awakening. This is an awakening to the expanded dimension of the kingdom of God. This is when you really started hearing more teaching about God's kingdom. Started being emphasized. Psalm 34, O magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. He heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. God's people have been magnifying their fears and anxiety, things other than who he is and what he's doing on the earth. We've been magnifying the wrong thing. 2012, a great arising. That was the emphasis of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61 through 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord shall be upon you. The nation shall come to your light, and kings to the what kings also represent leaders in these positions, to the brightness of your rising. His great pleasure will be to us and his image bearers reflect him in society and begin to eradicate darkness through the light that is on us. Okay, 2015, the emphasis was a great shining. Prepare yourself to begin contending for nations. Be prepared to be part of the gospel of salvation or salvation. Not just the gospel of salvation, but also now turn it to salvation. Now you're saved, now start solving problems. There's some problem wherever you work that you, you can bring solutions to. It may be very practical. Okay, and it can still be a God thing. God is a God of the practicality. Okay, he is practical. He makes sense out of things. He makes practical sense. Sheep nations. Okay, um, the shiny ones. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the children of God. Shining like the sun. As we're called to do now, to shine like the sun. Like never before. Shining with his brightness, with his glory. That's what we can expect in this year. To shine even brighter with his glory in our lives. Less darkness in our life, more of his light. All nations came to Joseph. So all nations came to Joseph. Read the seven mountain mandate for more. Okay. <laughs> we're not trying to survive as a church. We're called to deliver the world. We're cutting out of survival mode. And now we're in deliverance mode. We're delivering the world from darkness. Psalm 2.8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Why did it say that if we're not going to be about doing it? We're basically going to give up the ends of the earth to the devil and then Jesus is going to just save us out of that when he told us to ask for the nations and to take the earth for our possession. The earth is the Lord's, and it's been given to us as our inheritance. Let's take it by taking each mountain, one step at a time, each day at a time. Wherever God's placed you, acknowledge God. Ask God for solutions. Seek God. Be filled with the Spirit, and God will use you mightily, and you will be a mighty instrument to bring this world makeover. Amen? And we finished. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we'll close in prayer. Then any uh, questions? Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your, all that you've done, all that you revealed to us. And we just say, God, yes and amen. Have your way. Do your thing. We surrender to your will. And just love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.